So welcome again everybody to this Sutta study group. We have a very excellent Sutta for today. Uh, <clears throat> teaching that the Buddha gave to Anuruddha. Anuruddha, some of you may have heard of, probably most of you, was one of the great disciples, male Arahant disciples of the Buddha, foremost in the divine eye, the ability to see far and wide the bigger picture. And uh, this sort of takes place before Anuruddha became an Arahant. And actually, this teaching from the Buddha to Anuruddha is the teaching that enabled him to fully realize the Dhamma. And so it's rather wonderful. This was a teaching given to enable Anuruddha to become an Arahant. Anuruddha was the cousin of the Buddha. He ordained, you know, when the Buddha went back to his homeland after a few years after he became the Buddha, he went back to his homeland and he introduced the Dharma to his whole clan. And Anuruddha was one of the many cousins who then, you know, on hearing the Dharma, uh, ordained, got uh, let go of the household life and started practicing really seriously. So this sort of <clears throat> takes place in those early days of the Buddha's dispensation. And uh, Aya Sobhana, I'd just like to invite you if you'd like to make any introductory comments before we launch into this wonderful sutta. Um, this uh, uh, sutta was recommended in the course on stream entry by Ajahn Tanisaro. And um, in particular, uh, what um, this uh, Vidya Vimuti, uh, what he calls clear knowledge and release, is a um, uh, the culmination, or the, the uh, fulfillment and the uh, development of the factors of awakening, are said to culminate in this knowledge and release, which is um, it could be uh, Arahant ship, or it could be. Um, jumping over to the noble path by way of stream entry, or it could even be becoming a really um, well-based uh, faith follower or Dhamma follower uh, by being um, uh, convinced of the Dhamma. Uh, but uh, so this is talking about both the you know, the qualities that are preparing the mind to be able to wake up, and also what is it that puts yourself over the edge to wake up? And so this is what we find um, delightful. And this also sutta, this is a very pleasant sutta. Uh, some of the teachings are emphasizing uh, being uh, disillusioned or dispassionate or seeing the uh, dukkha and impermanence and so forth. Uh, but this uh, uh, sutta is uh, showing um, how the awakening stage has such a a pleasant quality. And so that may help us to feel optimistic and uh, lifted up. Thank you so much, Aya. Now this teaching really um, comes in, it's sort of three sections, this sutta. So I hope I'm thinking about maybe just reading about a third of the sutta straight off. Uh, the first sort of clear section, and then we'll see how we go from there. I think that will open up then to some discussion for us, for sure. So if you'll bear with me, I'll bring up the sutta, and I'd like to just, yeah, read quite a long passage. So before I start, um, let me invite you to really relax and, you know, come into the body and give your full attention, whole body attention, listening deeply to this beautiful Dharma. Iwam. Anuruddha and the Great Thoughts. This is Anguttara Nikaya, Chapter 8, Sutta 30. Anuruddha Mahavitaka Sutta. At one time, 
the Buddha was staying in the land of the Bhagas at Crocodile Hill in the deer park at Besakala's Wood. And at that time, Venerable Anuruddha was staying in the land of the Chetis in the Eastern Bamboo Park. Then, as Anuruddha was in private retreat, this thought came to his mind. This teaching is for those of few wishes, not those of many wishes. It's for the contented, not those who lack contentment. It's for the secluded, not those who enjoy company. It's for the energetic, not the lazy. It's for the mindful, not the unmindful. It's for those with immersion, not those without immersion. Samahita. It's for the wise, not the witless. Then the Buddha knew what Anuruddha was thinking. As easily as a strong person would extend or contract their arm, he vanished from the deer park at Besakala's wood in the land of the Bhagas, and he reappeared in front of Anuruddha in the eastern bamboo park in the land of the Chetis. He sat on the seat spread out. Anuruddha bowed to the Buddha and sat down to one side, and the Buddha said to him, Good, good, Anuruddha. It's good that you reflect on these thoughts of a great man. Maha Purisawitakang Witakesi. This teaching is for those of few wishes, not those of many wishes. Apicca, those of few wishes. This teaching is for the contented, not those who lack contentment. Santutta, contented, contentment. It is for the secluded, not those who enjoy company. Pawiwita. It is for the energetic, not the lazy. Aradawiriya, the energetic. It's for the mindful, not the unmindful. Upatita sati, the mindful, those who bring up mindfulness. It is for those with immersion, not those without immersion. Samahita. It is for the wise, not the witless, Panyawato. Well then, Anuruddha, you should also reflect on the following eighth thought of a great person. This teaching is for those who don't enjoy proliferating and don't like to proliferate not for those who enjoy proliferating and like to proliferate. Ni papanchara. Papancha is proliferation, making things kind of <clears throat> expanding in the mental realm. Ni papancha, those who do not enjoy proliferating. So friends, this is the first part. These qualities. I'm going to bring back so we can look at them again for us to also reflect on that this teaching is for those of few wishes, for those who are contented, for those who are secluded, for the energetic, the mindful, those with samadhi, with the ability to focus and for the wise. And the eighth contemplation that the Buddha gave to Anuruddha to add to this list, it is for those who do not enjoy proliferating, who don't like to proliferate. So we can, I think, consider these qualities, these reflections, and uh, <clears throat> I'd like to invite some discussion, conversation. Personally, I think it's good to consider, you know, do I have any 
weaknesses in these areas? And how can I, you know, how can I work with that? It's a good way, isn't it, to reflect with teachings like this, to reflect on our own qualities, our own strengths, as well as our weaknesses. Uh, what a great and valuable teaching for us. And so please feel free, anybody. And particularly, I'd like to just invite Aya Sobina, if you would like to begin with any thoughts on this first section. Well, I, it's interesting why this list was the list that was chosen for Anuruddha. There are, in different places, there are different kinds of lists of factors that are uh, good to have or good to contemplate. Uh, it seems to me that Anuruddha was a pampered prince who had, was very soft and luxurious. He had three palaces. He had servants that would get him anything he wants. So if he wants a grape, they would bring him a grape. And uh, he had uh, uh, female uh, musicians to entertain him. So he would uh, be uh, constantly surrounded by people. And so uh, we could see that uh, then uh, having a lot of wishes, uh, being uh, discontented, uh, being uh, lazy, or being inclined to sociability would be things that he had to overcome. He had to gain a seclusion from that culture. Uh, now, in modern times, uh, even an average modern person has more luxuries or greater than a prince or a king of the ancient times. Uh, so if we you know, want something, we can Google it on Amazon and push a button and it will come to us. And uh, these, this kind of uh, culture can uh, uh, create, we think we're getting everything we want, but actually it's causing us to be discontented. Um, so for that part, um, those things need to be cleared away. Thank you very much, Aya. Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? Especially number eight, in a way. Um, the challenge of not um, indulging in proliferation because we're living in a, as Aya Sobna says, you know, world, it's a very different world in a way, and we, we have access to unlimited information. Uh, it's difficult, isn't it, in a way? The mind is so uh, liable to want to investigate and learn. And if we don't direct all of that energy towards the Dharma, then we can really lose a lot of time and energy. Mm -hmm. Elaine. With seclusion, um, it, it really flies in the face of, of society nowadays, right? And I know a lot of people, older people especially, um, find themselves secluded. So um, is there any bad aspects of being too secluded? I know that sounds strange, but yeah, just could you talk about seclusion a bit more and why it's important? Thank you very much, Elaine. Uh, it's such a good point you make because, yeah, um, it's true, isn't it? People are lonely, people feel isolated, and you know, <clears throat> there's a there's a healthy seclusion that we can find ourselves seeking when we're practicing uh, the Dhamma, but um, when people don't have uh, spiritual resources or a sense of direction, a sense of purpose in this way, it can be very difficult to be alone. And I personally, I don't know about you all, but I know a lot of people who really can't bear to be on their own without the TV or the radio, you know, anything really, the voice of another. And uh, 
it's uh, kind of a tragedy, really, that, you know, that that's a mind then that can't tolerate silence and peace because it's not used to it, you know. I do think peace is a bit of an acquired taste in a way, and it's through the resourcing that the Buddha's teaching enables that we can actually begin to open to peace and enjoy peace. And with the enjoyment of peace is the enjoyment of solitude also, because we're not actually ever alone. We we are aware of how actually we're surrounded and connected to all things as we open to the practice. But when one is not um aware of this uh one can feel alienated and isolated when one is alone so i think this is really a very good point that you make and it's like what is solitude what is the solitude we might want and do we want it and i i i feel that uh yeah for for those who practice it becomes quite delicious right to be quiet to be alone to be peaceful to be meditating but one has to be trained in this way and you know may all those lonely people have the opportunity to find ways to uh open and recognize how uh, everything wants to support us when we practice for liberation and uh there is support um there but it's it's not being received and felt and uh known to everybody Alas. Aya Sobana, would you like to say anything on this point? Uh, well, the, the Buddha did acknowledge the value of the Kalyanamita, or the good friend, and uh, he recommended a, a balance. Uh, the harmonious monks were living together in silence for five days, and then on the fifth day they would spend... Uh, the whole night uh, talking about the Dhamma. So they had they had companionship, but they had a balance between companionship and uh, uh, time on their own. Yeah, thank you, Ian. I think I saw somebody's hand up, but I, I don't remember tree. who. My tree? My tree. I believe I actually it was dear Shan, but I did also have a thought. Um, the seclusion, so there's several aspects of seclusion, I believe, um, seclusion from society and from all the entertainment and all the, like, all, all everything, but also seclusion mm -hmm. from uh, thought. So uh, as um, Elaine, I believe, was asking about seclusion, I, uh, it came to my mind that uh, this, um, this four um, point, four factors that I think they're called the factors that incline one towards uh, Nibbana. And I think it starts with Viveka, uh, Viraga, Nirodha, and Vasagga Parinami. I, I think I've heard that and uh, pro probably I think from Bhante G, uh, but um, I think it starts with Viveka and then this Viveka seclusion is um, broken into many aspects of it, uh, including thoughts and how you like, um... anyways, uh, I wanted to add that yeah. because I was caught. Thank you so much, Maitri. That's a really good point because, you know, you've brought in that whole dimension for us of, you know, what is seclusion? And there are the different aspects of seclusion, right? So we can be physically in a secluded place and still have an incredibly busy mind, you know, that's full of, okay, the radio is off, the TV's off, but my mind is going, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it, that's not really, you know, seclusion in a way, because we're surrounded by the, you know, hordes in a way in our own heads. And then there's the seclusion of the heart and the mind, where we can actually begin to experience some quietude. And then there's the seclusion that one can experience with a quiet mind, even in the midst of uh, busyness, noise, um, complexity, 
uh, the crowd, you know. So so it's really important to recognize, you know, these different aspects of seclusion and consider all of them uh, with reference to this teaching. Because I think it basically the Buddha's um, suggesting that uh, we we are likely to do well in the practice if we enjoy our own company to be alone you know but actually that's not always possible and it doesn't mean we can't practice and it doesn't mean we can't experience seclusion the really profound seclusion of a quiet mind is possible for us so thank you for bringing that in Maitri that's a whole aspect that's really helpful for us to consider um, I can see Richard has a hand up and I'm aware that somebody else might have had a hand up. So if you did, just put it up again. And meantime, Richard, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ed. Um This uh, proliferation, uh, Sariputta explains this in uh, the Book of Fours, the Anguttara Nikaya. Uh, Sutta number 173, he's talking to uh, Venerable Maha Kotita, and he's asking, Maha Kotita asks him, you know, is there anything beyond uh, the cessation of the six bases of contact? Is there anything else? Is there nothing else? Is there something else and nothing else? Or is there uh, neither something else nor nothing else? And they're talking about the fading away and cessation of it. And in each case, uh, with each question, uh, Sariputta says, uh, uh, do not say so, friend. And then he explains, friend, uh, as far as the range of the six bases for contact extends, just so far extends the range of proliferation. As far as the range of proliferation extends, just so far extends the range of the six bases of contact with the remainderless fading away and cessation of the six bases for contact, there is the cessation of proliferation, the subsiding of pro proliferation. So uh, this is why when one attains the uh, fifth formless state, uh, which I translate as cessation of sense perception, one then has the chance, right? Seeing that sense per perception has stopped, one can then possibly stop the sankara, of arising, of wanting to have some kind of sense perception. And that's why with cessation can come this, you know, fading away and, and ending and everything of this uh, proliferation. Anyways, uh, I, I just wanted to make that point. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. This is wonderful. Yeah, how to really uh, be free from the risk or the danger or the inclination towards proliferation. Uh, and it's really interesting that you bring this in because the sutta goes on actually to, um, well, we'll see. The second part of the sutta is actually really pointing to how to develop all these eight qualities um, in the practice as Anuruddha is practicing and the Buddha is advising him in the practice. So we'll see how we meet this in the next section. But me meantime, uh, Dilsham. Yeah, may the blessings of the noble Kapilajan be with you all. Uh, this seclusion <laughs> is a very uh, a word that I can relate to, uh, mainly because, you know, I remember like when I chose Buddhism as a way of living for me, especially Nibbana being the ultimate goal, uh, like I started losing friends <laughs> because, you know, let's say people like to go out, you know, for a party or to see a band or to have a, you know a, an alcoholic drink and whatnot but then when you realize that you know those things you know can give you pleasure but then you know the ultimate goal which is nibbana gives you more pleasure so uh, i thought you know talking about nibbana is so important here because you know if someone if one is you know secluding for the goal of nibbana you know <laughs> It's worth living that life, you know, because, you know, like I as Obana mentioned, you know, you don't meet Kalyana Mitras, you know, uh, in normal life, you know, if they are dragging you towards, you know, sensual pleasures, you know, if someone is showing you the path to Nibbana, talking about Dhamma, showing the Dhamma, Dhamma, Patipada, 
the four steps that we have been talking, you know, and if they are walking you through the steps, you know, then it's worth, you know, sticking to them. But I also would like to uh, share a little story. I don't remember the, the sutta, but, you know, at the in Buddha's era, you know, there was this monk who used to live in caves, secluding himself from everybody thinking that, you know, he would, you know, develop unwholesome thoughts or maybe develop Raga, Dvesha and Moha. Uh, so, uh, and what, and so he was secluding himself, basically thinking that, you know, meeting people or maybe, you know, uh, like seeing a woman would, you know, create problems. So then uh, Buddha invited him over and asked, why are you doing this? So then Buddha in instructed him, you know, physically secluding yourself is not for us. You know, that's for Nigantas and whatnot. Just live your life as other monks would do, but make sure you seclude yourself from Ragadvesha and Moha. Those are the three, you know, uh, uh, things that, you know, we are going to deresonate, which leads us to Nibbana. Because at the end of the day, this is the case of Nibbana, isn't it? If Nibbana is not our goal, then, you know, there's no point of having all these discussions. Anyway, thank you so much for uh, giving me the time. Thank you so much, Doshan, for those excellent comments. Um, I'd like to, uh, just before the next um, person, just to invite Aya Sobana or Venerable Kuchina. Hello, Venerable. If any either of you would like to comment on oh, this oh, last Aya point. Oh, and yes, Aya Sobana, she says she has a limited uh, kind of ability to connect, but if you're there, Aya, um, if you'd like to make any comments also. <laughs> oh, hello. Um, yeah, I'm just keeping my video off because of the limited bandwidth. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Aya. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is this is quite a beautiful sutta, and um, I think it's just um, amazing that the compassion of the Buddha, how he's able to tune into his disciple, and he's just able to bring uh, in just the right teaching that that which helps uh, Venerable Anuruddha. Um, to awaken, but it, it also, as we'll see in the sutta, it's take, it take it's not like instantaneous, he works with it, and um, this is also showing that there's a reflections that we do. We think that there is that aspect of non proliferation, but to reflect on these wholesome qualities themselves, um. This, this reflection is a uh, part of uh, our meditative practice, as well as just like, uh, you know, there's an idea that no thinking is the ideal. And at, at the, at, at, as it is a progression, I think. This whole thing is a progression This of the um, eight. And then like you were saying, I have, uh, Brahmawara to consider which of these we're having trouble with and um, yeah ultimately we want to get to the point of uh, uh, delighting in non-proliferation but are we actually delighting in the the proper thing so we are is our mind uh, tending towards uh, few desires or uh are we content? Uh, yeah, so we can go th through this list, like you were saying. Um, do we resort to solitude? And then uh, that's really beautiful, this discussion about what that actually means, is uh, we wake up. Uh, so it's a, um, and, the, and then how, how is our mindfulness well established or not? Yeah, so to go through and really reflect on on all these points and um so the this uh, this is a uh, um comes up again and again the idea of a, a reflection so i i've been 
trying to um, incorporate reflections in my in my practice as well as just uh, um, encouraging non-proliferation. It's a kind of a challenge. That's a big challenge, I think, for most of us. <laughs> but thank you for um, inviting me to speak. Thank you so much, Ayasu Ijana. Really appreciate these reflections. Uh, Ayas, anybody else uh, at Damodarani like to say anything at this point? We can go ahead. Okay, wonderful. Um, we'll keep calling on you for wiser, wise words as the session goes on. Uh, meantime, Sheila, I think you had a hand up, please. Um, I hope you can remember what you wanted to say. Just briefly, good afternoon, I am. Um, with regard to seclusion, I had an interesting conversation with a therapist. I was doing some grief counseling and I reflected that I could hear the silence within the silence, which I found a very beautiful and peaceful place. And I found it quite interesting that she interpreted that as loneliness, me being lonely. And I assured her I wasn't, and that I in fact said, well, you know, that I found beauty in that space. And so again, in a society that doesn't value seclusion, uh, inner peace, even um, just peace, and I thought that we, are all in sanghas examples of what could be and perhaps modeling for others and not about per perfection but there is another way there's another path and there's a lot of satisfaction in seclusion and um, reflecting on these qualities thank you Sati, Sati, Sati. Thank you so much, Sheena. That's so beautiful. Uh, listening to the silence within the silence. Friends, I think it would be good now to, that was just such a beautiful conclusion of this section. Let's move on to the next section. Um, I'll just put up the sutta and let's see where it takes us. So the Buddha has given Anuruddha the eighth uh, great thought to reflect upon. Uh, he has these wonderful eight considerations that he's bringing into his practice. I'm going to just read through them again. This teaching is for those of few wishes, for the contented, the secluded, which is Viveka. Viveka, for the energetic, for the mindful, for those with immersion, samahita, for the wise, and for those who don't enjoy proliferating, who don't like to proliferate. And then the Buddha goes on to say to Anuruddha, first, you'll reflect on these eight thoughts of a great person, and then Whenever you want, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unskillful qualities, you'll enter and remain in the first absorption, which has the rapture and bliss born of seclusion, while placing the mind and keeping it connected. So this is the first jhana, qualities of vitaka, vichara, the mind that's honing in on the object and maybe wobbling a little bit, but basically coming back again and again to the object and the peace and the well-being that arises as a result of this degree of immersion. The Buddha goes on. You'll enter and remain in the second absorption, which has the rapture and bliss born of immersion. 
with internal clarity and mind at one, without placing the mind and keeping it connected. So the quality of further calming of the mind and the bliss that results, the PT that arises as the mind becomes more focused. So the second jhana. So Anuruddha, as he continues these reflections, this practice, you'll enter and remain in the third absorption, where you'll meditate with equanimity, mindful and aware, personally experiencing the bliss of which the noble ones declare, equanimous and mindful, one meditates in bliss. And so the third jhana, Anuruddha will experience this, where the rapture becomes still more calm, more peaceful, sukha is the predominant state of mind, uh, contentment, happiness that's more equanimous, still more one-pointed, the mind more and more settled, then giving up pleasure and pain and ending former happiness and sadness, you'll enter and remain in the fourth absorption, the fourth jhana, without pleasure or pain, with pure equanimity and mindfulness. And in a way, I think, Richard, you touched on this, although you were talking about the fifth jhana, this place of letting go of the body and so focus the mind, just a pure equanimity, calm that is unruffled. And obviously, these four states um, all uh, involve the hindrances in abeyance. The hindrances are not present. Anuruddha is no longer thinking about the reflections. The reflections have led him to this one-pointedness of mind that has then enabled him to practice the jhana. And the Buddha goes on, first you'll reflect on these eight thoughts of a great person and you'll get the four absorptions, blissful meditations in the present life that belong to the higher mind. You'll get these four absorptions when you want, without trouble or difficulty. So <laughs> this is Anuruddha, this is Anuruddha's experience. And I'd like to read a little bit more uh, before we go into discussion. So he goes on, then as you live contented, your rag robe will seem to you like a chest full of garments of different colors seems to a householder or a householder's child. It will be for your enjoyment, relief and comfort and for alighting upon extinguishment, Nibbana. And the Buddha goes on, he says to Anuruddha, as you live contented in this way, your scraps of alms food will seem to you like boiled fine rice with the dark grains picked out, served with many soups and sauces, seems to a householder or a householder's child. So we're getting the uh, idea of the supreme contentment uh, with simple life basic needs being met. It will be for your enjoyment, relief and comfort and for alighting upon Nibbana. As you live contented, your lodging at the root of a tree will seem to you like a bungalow plastered inside and out, draft free with latches fastened and window shutters seams to a householder or householder's child. So that the root of a tree feels so safe so secure, so comfortable for such a person. It will be for your enjoyment, relief and comfort and for alighting upon Nibbana. And as you live contented, your lodging at the root of a tree will seem to you like a couch spread with woolen covers, shag piled, pure white or embroidered with flowers and spread with a fine deer hide, with a canopy above and red pillows at both ends, seems to a householder or householder's child. This is the idea of absolute luxury 
at the time of the Buddha. It will be for your enjoyment, relief and comfort and for alighting upon extinguishment. As you live contented in this way, your rancid urine as medicine will seem to you like various medicines, ghee, butter, oil, honey and molasses seem to a householder or householder's child. It will be for your enjoyment, relief and comfort and for alighting upon extinguishment. So these are the basic, the most basic requisites that we as bhikkhunis, bhikkhus enjoy. And when we're practicing well in this way, we simply don't need anything else. We're so happy. We're so contented with these basic needs being met. How beautiful, how inspiring. The Buddha goes on to say, well, Anuruddha, for the next rainy season, you should stay right here in the land of the Chetis in the Eastern Bamboo Park. Yes, sir, Anuruddha replied. And after advising Anuruddha like this, the Buddha, as easily as a strong person would extend or contract their arm, vanished from the Eastern Bamboo Park in the land of the Chetis and reappeared in the Deer Park at Besakala's Wood in the land of the Baggers. So I'll stop there. Uh, so really, um, this is then giving us an idea of how these reflections, in the case of Anuruddha, led to his ability to develop the jhanas and to really move towards freedom. And uh, the Buddha is asking him to just don't go anywhere, just carry on with the same practice uh, for some more time. And of course, Anuruddha agrees. And so this is his contemplation, and this is the result of his contemplation, that he can develop this degree of peace and equanimity. Aya Sobhana, would you like to add anything at this point? And looping back to the uh, description of the four jhanas, and remembering that they start with this uh, uh, vivikcheva, Kamehi, uh, this uh, seclusion from sensual craving. Uh, just a few minutes ago, Richard was mentioning how the proliferation is arising from the contact of the six senses. Uh, so when one is not um, separated from craving, any contact of the senses can create a pleasant feeling which can trigger off uh, a desire or an unpleasant feeling triggering off aversion. And uh, with that desire and aversion can be triggering off different kinds of perceptions or stories or intentions. And thus uh, the mind is going into the round of proliferation. So then uh, this is sort of, uh, we can see just the very first point of Samadhi about uh, having that uh, seclusion uh, from the sensual craving is cutting a gigantic two-thirds or three-quarters off of the tendency of proliferation. Uh, I was, there's something that could be a little confusing about thinking that our um, robe, our simple robe is going to be like having a huge wardrobe with a lot of, you know, silks and so forth, or that our a simple mat on the floor is going to be the same as a, a luxurious bed with red pillows and uh, um, embroidered uh, uh, comforters and so forth, uh, because uh, a demand that wants to get into craving could get into craving, even about the simple monastic mat or the uh, simple basic monastic requisite of food are the simple, you know, the simple monastic things, the mind that's discontented or dissatisfied uh, can get involved in them in the wrong way. Uh, but what I, I guess this is, is saying is that um, it's, it's kind of like a, a fantasy, isn't it? That if you really could have this ideal bed with the embroidered Coverlet with the flowers and the uh, 
and the red pillows and the deer hide that finally you would feel happy. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, but it's not the thing that makes you happy, it's the contentment that makes you happy. So the contentment is like even better than the most luxurious luxury. Thank you so much, Aya. Yes, very, very good point, isn't it? It's the state of mind. Yeah. Aya Suijana, please. So um, I've been out here in the forest and um, it's very unpredictable. Like sometimes the propane tank runs out uh, of fuel and it's pouring down rain or something like that, or it's freezing cold or something. So you have to just be bearing the cold. And um, I think for me to abandon aversion is a aversion or is a kind of desire i see more and more so if I, i'm feeling averse to the cold then i'm craving the desire desiring the the warmth or the having the white or feeling i might be feeling like i'm a victimized that the storm comes in just in the propane running out seemed to coincide at the same time. So it's a kind of like this contentment is that, you know, not that I have, a, you know, all the amenities, but that uh, the cold is just a sensation. And then I can co also cope with it. I can, um, but then it, it ceases to be a problem. And it, and so it's it's really the mind, you know, and what the mind does to circum with circumstances as they arise, because it's inevitable. It's just very funny here because the, the water starts giving us trouble, you know, the pump is giving us trouble, or some. It's it, all these things always happen when the the storm is coming in, or something like that. But how how we worked as a team just to face the situation and calmly so this uh, contentment and um, not being ruffled being unruffled um, I think that goes into it's it's interesting because it more than just kind of like uh, as the is saying it, that, that we're not going to be craving to have that the it's not going to seem like I'm having butter instead of some kind of bitter medicine or something. It's just that uh, we're contented with it, that it's not, it's not a problem. Uh, it's not lacking or something. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, but uh, that's, a, that's a, what's occurring to me. Uh, thank you for calling on me and thank you for, uh, your beautiful reflections on the, uh, the sutta. Thank you so much, Ayasui Jana. We're really appreciating you doing the practice out there in the forest, which is just such an inspiration to us all. May the water run clear and may the gas flow. <laughs> Richard. <laughs> Go ahead, Richard. Uh, thank you, Raya. Uh, in terms of this, I think it's important to notice that uh, in the sutra, now I have Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation here, but he says, when Aniruddha, you reflect upon these eight thoughts of a great person and gain at will without trouble or difficulty these four jhanas that constitute the higher mind, abhicheta, and are pleasant dwelling in this very life, then while you dwell content, etc. So the key is that you've come to this point where you've mastered your mind so thoroughly that you can just instantly go into any of these four jhanas at will. And so you're kind of like on a different level. Uh, so um, I also want to make a note. Uh, there's this one sutra where a king had become a bhikkhu under the, under the Buddha. And uh, every once in a while, other bhikkhus would hear him exclaim, 
something like, uh, oh, what bliss, oh, what bliss, something like that. And, and they were kind of curious. So they went to the booth and said, you know, there's this bhikkhu over here. And he keeps saying, oh, what bliss. So, okay, call him here. And so when he comes over, the Buddha says, is it true that every once in a while you exclaim, oh, what bliss, oh, what bliss? He says, yes. And then, well, why? Why are you saying that? Because there is a thing where uh, just living in the forest itself, this is like the, 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 the simplest, most wrong view of nibbana. Just, just that contentedness of no responsibilities and living alone in part, that's Nibbana, okay? So I think that's why the monks were wondering, you know, has he fallen into this? It doesn't come out in the sutta, but that's my impression, you know, has he fallen into this wrong view? And he, and he, he goes on to describe, he says, well, when I was a king, you know, I had to constantly be guarding myself and surrounded by soldiers and armies, and I was in constant fear, <laughs> you know, that, that someone or something was going to try to overthrow me and everything. And now I can just live this happy, simple, contented life. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, Buddha said, oh, yeah, okay, that's good. That's good. I mean, he wasn't making this, you know, that, that uh, just as happy as Nibbana. He wasn't equating it with Nibbana. He was just saying, I'm so relieved now. You know, I don't have to worry about any of that stuff anymore. Anyways, this suit of kind of, kind of reminds me of that. <laughs> Uh, that's what I to say. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Richard, for bringing that sutta in, because it's a really good one, isn't it, to reflect upon in relation to these eight great thoughts, these eight reflections, because, you know, there's somebody who's actually really rejoicing in simplicity and not longing for all those luxuries and all the papancha, really, all the sense realm can provide. And that's so inspiring. And yes, you know, we can maybe all recognize to some extent the joy we can feel when we simplify, when we let go of things, yeah, when we downscale, when we're not taken in by, you know, advertisements that are trying to make us feel inadequate or un discontented with what we have, when we're not falling for that, when we're actually aware and, and resting in the knowledge that renunciation is real happiness. Less is more, you know. So that sutta is a, a beautiful example of this. And we can say that if we yeah, have the inclination actually to long for pleasant things and to miss, you know, the kinds of foods that we used to enjoy or whatever, those uh, kind of experiences are not a problem. It's just showing us that, yes, there is there is a bit of a, there's an opportunity to, to re- uh, realign, you know, consider this, consider that actually one can be very contented with the simplest of ways in which our needs can be met. How wonderful. Uh, the Buddha's telling us, you know, this is something really valuable to reflect upon. And I think you also made a very important point, Richard, that with the jhana practice, when Anuruddha is experiencing uh, great peace, great calm, the benefits of the practice, then, of course, you know, he's liable to be able to really develop these eight uh, reflections to the full and to be such a person, a person who's delighted with solitude, with, uh, you know, just the, the basics and uh, peaceful abiding, mindfulness, uh, energy and so forth. So thank you very much, Richard, for those reflections and for bringing in that sutta for us. Um, anyone else like to come in at this point? Okay, friends, we can continue. Oh, Corinna. Thank you, Aya. Um, yes, yeah, just a, a question to sort of to flesh this out a little more um, because I can get... I ideal about it um and thinking oh you know my goal is to be satisfied with <laughs> fermented urine for medicine <laughs> um and <laughs> yeah um and that's that's the one i have the hardest trouble with actually um and you know so i've got some health issues and there there are certain you know lo lots of extra things um, that I do for my health that I, I do that I didn't have to do back in, you know, a few years ago, even. Um, but now they're like simple things like electrolytes, like I'm 
<laughs> I just ordered from Amazon like potassium citrate to mix in with my sodium chloride anyway to make my own electrolytes because um, it's something like I, I really need to take care of with blood pressure and so I think it's it's hard if you if any advice on the distinguishing the difference between um what's going too far and what's like well no actually this is this is helpful and i realize that regardless of what i do you know it, it is it is a bit of a, a burden it's not a problem um but it i it takes extra effort to sort of keep me functioning um at a, at a more energetic level, even to be able to, to meditate, for example, to have that energy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karina. I'm really glad that you share this with us because it's like coming to the ground, you know, coming to the reality of this mind and body and, you know, how best to take care of it, how best to take care of this, these conditions here. And we can reflect on these teachings and really um, recognize, you know, all the aspects that we are practicing and the ways in which we can strengthen and also wisely consider, you know, what is the most simple way that I can live in a way that's looking after, you know, my health. If I have health issues like many of us do, what's the simplest way I can take care of? And also, you know, not delight in proliferating around, but just to be kind of sensible and realistic about caring for this one. And that's, you know, great wisdom. That is the panya, actually, that's the wisdom aspect to to have a, a, a an overview and to see the reality of the situation. So thank you for bringing that in because it's really important. We can enjoy the ideals and then we, we need to find how this teaching can actually apply to my situation. And I know very well that for each of us, there'll be a, a few absolute gold nuggets in here that we can take away and we can work with, and it will be different things for different people. And so, yeah, great compassion for our these bodies that are so vulnerable and so prone to difficulties and how important for all of us as practitioners to treat this body like the temple that it is and to really pay attention and look out and look look after it. So thank you so much, Corinna, for bringing that in. And um, Ananea. Um, yeah, I really am happy that um, Karina um, brings this up because, as most of you know, I have had some, that last fall had really major um, events happening. Um, and fortunately, there hasn't been a huge amount of extra effort to just keep the body going. Um, but this whole thing about now that I am older and, and um, uh, having seri uh, two serious bouts with uh, getting very close to, um, you know, a possible exit at that point. Um, so there is a, for me now is uh, how much, and it has been this way for a long time because I was around, I was actually a little younger than Karina when my autoimmune problem uh, began. And so there was always adjustment over the years of, you know, something else would start or it's, there's some facet would, would appear that hadn't been there and requiring, you know, an extra or something. So now it is, it, it's, it's like um, I was at my physical therapist the other day and uh, it's like, well, do I, is it even worth it? Not that it wouldn't be worth my, buying a little gizmo that would help with this, you know, uh, mouth thing. But it's just like, you know, is that really for the amount of time, you know, I'm really looking at, well, for the amount of time you have left, what are we focusing on here? And even in terms of health, not to let my, you know, like say, oh, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to, you know, whatever. But it, it is really an interesting, an interesting uh, trying to reach some sort of balance or rebalancing with that. And again, knowing, I mean, I'm certainly not um, some poster poster person for 
uh, doing things perfectly or having all the, you know, the Dhamma ducks lined up in a row and I'm, you know, consistent. But um, I think the compassion and, and, and being self-forgiving becomes even more and more important in uh, you know, it's like this is this is this is how and I Ajahn Sumano says this all the time. Um, this is this is how 78 is. This is it. This is how it is at 78. And it isn't the same as it was at 40 or 44, but it's so that but it's this way now. And 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 um wanting to to still be in a frame of mind where one is engaging with what the sutta is pointing out. Uh, some things about proliferation get less and less, like wanting possessions or wanting things. I'm going to still rooting out, let it go. You know, I don't want you know to acquire, but to really still maintain that within the limitations that are appearing, or that seem to be appearing, and that's that's the mental thing. Like I guess Vijana was mentioning about being in the extreme cold. I mean, I can't even imagine. <laughs> but yet there have been times I've had to, I have had to do things that I would never have imagined I'd be able to do. And so it, it's dealing with, and that, I, I just read something recently, and I'm sorry, I don't, can't give you the, can't give you the, re, the uh, reference, but that, you know, this, it's all, it's sort of illusory to, to think about being, you know, this being in present time, you're always just there or you're always going, I mean, that, you know, so there's this thing about being in the present moment can only, well, maybe it was Richard who brought this up the other day. Anyway, you know, you can only ever be sort of going to and just from. And so, you know, trying to keep all of that in some sort of balance in order to have moments of increasing moments of contentment in spite of all that what whatever is happens uh, to be going on so thank you for that thank you Ananaya so much for those beautiful reflections you know it's very good for us all to hear about 78 um, some of us might be more than 78 some of us will be less and it's just you know here we are friends and this is how it is and I just love the when people share from the heart um, we can really learn so much from each other uh, thank you thank you for your words about contentment and how it can be cultivated in the midst of you know even really severe illness and long recovery processes that is really heartening friends I think I would like to suggest that we Return to the Sutta. Uh, this is a beautiful third section we're coming to, which is where the Buddha actually is fleshing out a little bit these eight great thoughts, these great contemplations. So I think this will be of great interest and something that we can take away with us. And I would so recommend reading the Sutta again. Uh, but here we go. Let's look at this last section. So, the Buddha has seen Anuruddha, he's travelled to see him through his psychic powers, given him the teaching, told him to just stay where he is and practice with these eight great thoughts, these great contemplations and practising the jhana, first four jhanas. And then the Buddha returns to Bhaga country, where he also has a group of monastics around him. And... He gives them this teaching directly from Anuruddha. So let's hear it again, friends. The Buddha says, and what are the eight thoughts of a great person? This teaching is for those of few wishes, not those of many wishes. It's for the contented, not those who lack contentment. It's for the secluded, not those who enjoy company. It's for the energetic, not the lazy. It's for the mindful, not the unmindful. It's for those with immersion, not those without immersion. It's for the wise, not the witless. It's for those who don't enjoy proliferating and don't like to proliferate, not for those who enjoy proliferating and like to proliferate. 
This teaching is for those of few wishes, not those of many wishes. That's what I said, but why did I say it? A mendicant with few wishes doesn't wish. May they know me as having few wishes. When contented, they don't wish. May they know me as contented. When secluded, they don't wish. May others know me as secluded. When energetic, they don't wish. May others know me as energetic. When mindful, when immersed, when wise, and when not enjoying proliferation, they don't wish. May others know me as one who has these qualities. This teaching is for those of few wishes, not those of many wishes. That's what I said, and that is why, this is why I said it. So just to briefly say, this is very interesting to consider. This is the definition the Buddha gives for being of few wishes, not wishing around others, views and impressions about ourselves, not selfing, not selfing self and not selfing others. So there's a lot there, but I'm not going to stop. I'm going to read on. The Buddha goes on. This teaching is for the contented, not those who lack contentment. That's what I said. Why did I say it? It's for a mendicant who's content with any kind of robes, alms food, lodgings and medicines and supplies for the sick. This teaching is for the contented, not those who lack contentment. That's what I said, and this is why I said it. This teaching is for the secluded, not those who enjoy company. That's what I said. Why did I say it? It's for one who lives secluded. But monks, nuns, laymen, laywomen, rulers, ministers, monastics of other religions, and their disciples go to visit us. With a mind slanting, sloping, and inclining to seclusion, withdrawn, and loving renunciation, we invariably give each person a talk, emphasizing the topic of dismissal. This teaching is for the secluded, not those who enjoy company. That is what I said, and this is why I said it. I just want to point out, it's almost as if the Buddha is saying, we're bound to be surrounded by people from time to time, if not all the time. Can we relate to them in such a way that we're not encouraging proliferation, that we're encouraging simplicity and ultimately seclusion? The Buddha goes on, this teaching is for the energetic, not the lazy. That's what I said, but why did I say it? It's for one who lives with energy roused up, for giving unskillful qualities, giving up unskillful qualities, and for embracing sp skillful qualities. We can be strong, staunchly vigorous, not slacking off when it comes to developing skillful qualities. This teaching is for the energetic, not the lazy. That's what I said. This is why I said it. So here the energy is like the right effort to bring up the skillful and let go of the unskillful, putting our energy into this. This teaching is for the mindful, not the unmindful. This teaching is for one who is mindful. They have utmost mindfulness and alertness and can remember and recall what was said and done long ago. This teaching is for one with immersion, one who has a concentrated, focused ability to um, experience, inclined towards peace. It's for one who quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unskillful qualities, enters and remains in the first, jhana, the second, the third and the fourth absorptions. This teaching is for those with immersion, not those without immersion. This teaching is for the wise, not the foolish. It's for one who's wise. 
one who has the wisdom of arising and passing away, which is noble, penetrative, and leads to the complete ending of suffering. This teaching is for the wise, not the witless. And finally, this teaching is for those who don't enjoy proliferating and don't like to proliferate. Not for those who enjoy proliferating and like to proliferate. This teaching is for one whose mind is secure, confident, settled and decided regarding the cessation of proliferation. That is what I said. This is why I said it. And just to conclude the sutta, Anuruddha stayed the next rainy season in the land of the Chetis in the eastern bamboo park and living alone, withdrawn, diligent, keen and resolute, he soon realised the supreme culmination of the spiritual path in this very life. He lived having achieved with his own insight the goal for which we rightly go forth from the lay life to homelessness. He understood rebirth is ended. The spiritual journey has been completed. What had to be done has been done. There is no return to any state of existence. And Venerable Anuruddha became an Arahat. He recited these verses on this occasion. Knowing my thoughts, the supreme teacher in the world came to me in a mind-made body, using his psychic power. He taught me more than I'd thought of. The Buddha, who loves non-proliferation, taught me non-proliferation. Understanding that teaching, I happily did his bidding. I've attained the three knowledges and have fulfilled the Buddha's instructions. Awam. So friends, it's a race through, but I actually really do encourage you to have another look. Anguttara Nikaya, 8.30. And isn't it beautiful? We have the Buddha describing these eight reflections in more detail. There's so much there. We could spend another week or more discussing in, in greater depth. But for now, I'd like to invite Ayasovana to... Come in. Uh, this is um, 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 a point of clarification. Um, the um, sentence about um, in seclusion, speaking on the topic of dismissal, um, sounds a bit cruel, doesn't it? That um, uh, the accomplished monk, when people come to ask him questions about the Dharma, or uh, when um, uh, the, I heard this happens a lot in. Um, maybe everywhere in the world, if you have a monk who really is a powerful meditator who goes to stay in a cave and are, is really practicing meditation, um, then uh, the word gets around in the neighborhood and the people hear, oh, there's a solitary monk practicing meditation. And then they all want to bring Donna. So then every day they have 10 or 15 people coming around wanting to offer the lunch Donna and the monk has to um, uh, speak with him. And, and then, um, uh, but, uh, in the um, commentary, this is brought out in um, Analia's um, uh, book about the middle length discourses. Uh, that word uh, is understood in the parallel text as incitement. So it's to arousing them to spiritual urgency, arousing them to practice. So it doesn't necessarily have that meaning that the monk um, is just so uh, callous that um, he just wants to get rid of people who who come out of out of faith to um, uh, speak about the dharma. Number seven, the, the seventh thought. Is it for referencing the spring runner and and not for those who are not spring runners? Seventh thought. Uh, the, uh, Satima is asking whether these seven thoughts are with reference to one who's a stream winner or not. Yeah. Uh, actually, um, Anuruddha was a stream winner when he had these seven thoughts. I think he was uh, um, a once returner. Uh, but in order to uh, uh, become an arahant, he needed the eighth thought. Okay. 
covers up the seventh, the, the seventh thought about no. rising and passing away. The wisdom, wisdom of rising and passing away. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so that's the question. Uh, the wisdom of arising and passing away, that would be like the right view, which is uh, one of the ways that the um, opening of the Dhamma eye is described. Um, uh, at uh, at stream entry. Yeah, thank you very much, Raya Sobana. It is a really lovely point, actually. Um, I think Seminary Satama made the, this aspect of wisdom here for us to consider when the Buddha is talking about the quality of wisdom. Um, it is the wisdom of Anicca Sanya. So I really feel this is very powerful. And it's, yes, the insight of a stream enterer um, to profoundly recognize that there's everything's changing all the time, like moment by moment, total change, this insight. And then for Anuruddha to take him all the way to arahantship, that is the contemplation, that is the wise contemplation. Um, that's really significant and helpful to highlight. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we have very little time, and I've just uh, read this incredible third section of the sutta, which is so profound. I almost feel sorry that we have to stop. We could continue talking for many hours, um, but time is um, <laughs> a, a, a delusion, but nevertheless, <laughs> the clock is ticking. Um, I'd like to invite, actually, for these last moments, um, Aya Soban, if you'd like to come in with any reflections for us, any parting reflections, please. Um, well, uh, this path is the path of insight or path of wisdom. And uh, uh, coming to the uh, final result is because of a change of view, seeing things in a completely different way. Uh, all the qualities that are more like the feeling or the emotional side or the presence of craving or the freedom from craving and aversion, uh, that's more like a, there's like the motivation side and the understanding side. Uh, when we go bit by bit and our reactivity calms down, then we're able to see things more clearly. When we can see things more clearly, then the reactivity calms down. So then it becomes like uh, climbing a ladder, doesn't it? That we just become a little bit more calm and a little bit more clear, a little bit more clear and a little bit more calm. Uh, but then at the very end, it's not, you know, like the ultimate happiness or what we're aiming for is not just a state of being completely calm. The thing that we're aiming for at the end is that that clarity, that wisdom, uh, that insight. It's just that uh, the Buddha so beautifully uh, shows us how to get uh, situated in the space where we have a possibility of being able to see things so clearly. Mm -hmm. Sadhu, so. sadhu, sadhu. Thank you so much, Raya Sobhana. I'd like to invite Raya Sobhana to close for us with the closing homages to our great teacher, the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. Um, Pagawatan <laughs>
Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Ryan. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Venerables.